Have you ever struggled with anxiety? Have you wrestled with racing thoughts, stress, fear and worry? Maybe you're going through this right now. Or maybe someone you love has been dealing with significant anxiety. Anxiety is a common phenomenon in our world and in our churches, and it raises a lot of questions. What is anxiety? Is it sinful to worry? Can God actually help me with my anxiety? Well, this video is all about how the Bible and biblical wisdom can help us deal with anxiety. Paul Grimmond, the Dean of Students at Moore Theological College in Sydney, came and spoke for our church on this topic at one of our nights that we call Big Ideas Nights. And Paul has a deep knowledge of the Bible, a pastoral heart for people, and personal experience of anxiety. And we found his teaching so helpful, and I'm sure you will too. Well, let's hear from Paul now on the topic of anxiety. Um, thanks so much for having me tonight. I really appreciate being able to come up and chat with you guys. Um, I really want to do a couple of things tonight. I want to try and put a little bit of biblical framework in place to think, how do we think about anxiety from a biblical perspective? And then I want to get concrete about that. But before I do any of that, I thought I'd tell you just a little bit of my own story. Um, I grew up, uh, again, as a fairly anxious kid, although I had no language to describe that. I just got distressed about things and worried about things. Um, as a teenager, uh, I experienced a string of what I now know were panic attacks, although I, I didn't tell my parents about them. I had no idea what they were. I just knew that they were terrifying when they happened. And for me, it was mostly around my fear of death and eternity. So if the subject of death or eternity came up, um, and you've got to remember that I was living through the 1980s. So we used to, the standard documentary that I watched as a kid on television was how to build a nuclear fallout shelter in your backyard in the event of nuclear war. And the other standard thing that happened on television was that it was the time of the initial HIV AIDS epidemic. And so every three months or so, 60 Minutes would run something on the AIDS epidemic. And I would go to bed that night absolutely sure uh, that I was going to have AIDS and I was going to die and it was all going to be over. Um, I particularly remember just the feeling of absolute terror lying in my bed thinking about eternity and everything in my body took off. It was almost like it was on fire and the noise was so loud and I desperately, desperately sought for something else that I could think about to make it all go away. I wasn't Christian. My family weren't Christian. I had no contact with Christian things particularly at that time, but I just had all these experiences as a kid. In God's kindness, that fear of death actually brought me uh, to listen to some friends of mine who were at school who started sharing with me about Jesus. And it was such a relief to know that there was a God who had made me and that when Jesus died, he forgave all of my sin and there was actually a hope of life beyond death. Uh, and that was a great gift from God to me in that time. Um, I, as I kind of went on, I got to my late teenage years, things kind of died out down for a while and got kind of calmer for a little while. Uh, and then kind of in my mid to late 20s, uh, as I particularly approached the birth of my first child, um, I started to go through another set of episodes. Uh, and this time I had what um, doctors call ice pick pains in the side of your head. Um, it's, a, it's a searing pain that only lasts a couple of seconds for me. Um, but I would get these incredibly sharp pains in the side of my head that would last and then disappear. And then as soon as that happened, I thought I was going to die. Uh, and I would get these periods of nausea and faintness and exhaustion. And I'd nearly always end up in casualty. And they'd do a whole string of tests and say, there's nothing wrong with you. Go home and you'll be okay. Um, after going through that experience, probably maybe four or five times over the space of maybe a couple of years. I had one particularly big episode uh, at the end of church one night. Uh, and uh, Sorry, one thing happened before that. I had one of these episodes at a friend's house. And in response to that, again, I didn't know this at the time, I started to hyperventilate. Um, hyperventilation um, in its extreme form mimics a heart attack. So it starts to suck stuff out of your muscles in your body. Uh, and I felt this pain kind of run down both my arms and this band across my chest that felt like it was kind of constricting. And I lay on my friend's lounge room floor while they rang the ambulance. And I was absolutely persuaded that I was having a heart attack. The ambulance guys arrived. We had a little bit of a chat. They said, you're going to be totally OK. I 
great. That was, that was a Friday afternoon, Sunday night after church, had another big episode and ended up in casualty. And while I was lying in casualty, um, there were a few really loud noises happened. And in response to those loud noises, my body started to perform involuntary muscle spasms. So there would be a loud noise and my arms would fly into the air like this in response to the loud noise, which was utterly terrifying and made me feel slightly stupid all at the same time. Um, I spent a week in hospital while they investigated everything under the known universe about what was happening to me. They ended up sending me home, but a guy sent me off to a psychiatrist and apparently I had, and I was studying at Bible college, so this is quite embarrassing, a thing called a conversion disorder. Isn't that wonderful, the language that they use for these things? Uh, but what a conversion disorder is, it's actually your body starting to kind of somatically work out your anxiety. You feel all this anxiety, and then you experience real physical bodily symptoms that is your brain and your body responding to those things. So I learned that my arms flinging up into the air in response to loud noises was actually kind of a, an involuntary but kind of semi-conscious weird kind of response for me trying to find some sense and make some sense of my anxiety. And I, you'll be pleased to know that it stopped happening. Uh, I'm certainly pleased that it stopped happening. Um, for me... Um, that period of talking to the psycho psychiatrist was really helpful. Uh, I did a little bit of counselling at that point, learnt some breathing exercises and things to help me calm down when I got really anxious. Um, but it also affected me in that long term I was quite anxious. Uh, and uh, in my ministry role, I ended up in a very senior ministry role in a place very early on in my life. So two years out of Bible college, I ended up as kind of the senior pastor. Uh, at uni church at the University of New South Wales. And over the next few years as I did ministry there, I just got more and more exhausted. Um, my first year in the job, my father-in-law died from a brain tumour. Um, we had two young children. My wife had postnatal anxiety and depression after the birth of our third kid. Life got really hard and I, I kind of got to the point of being completely burnt out uh, and went and spent about 18 months seeing a counsellor and changing jobs and stuff like that. So um, I, I describe myself as kind of uh, recoveringly anxious. Um, that is, I still feel the symptoms. I've learnt lots of gifts and skills and things that God's given me through lots of people in my life that help me to manage stuff. And I'm a bit more aware of what's going on in my body. And some days I do better than others and some periods of my life I do better than others. Um, that's my story. As part of all of that, uh, over the last few years in particular, um, a bunch of churches in different places have asked me to come and talk about it, which has made me stop and read a lot and think a lot about what the Bible's got to say. Uh, and I've just I've written a book, which is actually somewhere on a boat between China and here. Um, it, it's due out sometime in the next couple of months. Um, lots of what I'm going to talk to you tonight are little snippets of broader things that I've kind of written about in that book. But let me just talk then for briefly with you guys a bit about kind of a biblical understanding of what anxiety looks like and then some practical realities. So the first thing I want to say is that in terms of kind of being Christian with this stuff, one of the things that I've learned from lots of pastoral experience and my own experience is that for Christians, it's not just the experience of the anxiety, but it's the terror of what it means for your relationship with God. Because most of us know, what does the Bible say about anxiety? It says, don't be anxious about anything. Um, ask anyone with anxiety, they'll be able to tell you what uh, Philippians 4 says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. <laughs> um, and they'll also be able to tell you that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells you that you shouldn't be anxious either. So I have this thing that happens in me that I don't seem to be able to control, but God tells me that I shouldn't be doing it. And so when I experience it, it's not just the experience of the anxiety in itself, but it's the question about what does it mean for my relationship with God? What does it mean about my obedience as a servant of Jesus? And how do I live with this thing in light of that? Um, you'll see there on the outline, there's a little quote uh, from a dear friend of mine who I think has suffered worse from anxiety uh, than anybody else that I know. Um, and uh, she is now doing well, but after about 15 years of in and out of hospital and a whole bunch of other things that have been really, really painful. She describes, and I find this really helpful, her anxiety. She says, it's like a bit like, you know, those spinning colourful wheels that when they spin fast enough, they go white. She says, most of the time, my thoughts and my emotions are white. They're going so fast that I don't know what they are. And it just feels like noise and I can't cope with it. 
and occasionally the wheel spins slow enough that I can make out a few colours and describe them. Okay? Um, but for her, she would say, again, the biggest issue for her is a sense of guilt. And so what I want to do is I want to encourage you to have a biblical model that actually makes sense that a lot of what anxiety sufferers feel is actually being part of a fallen created world that they're not responsible for, they're not in control of, but they need to work out how to take some responsibility for. That's the big thing that I want to say. But let me step back. Who are we? How are we made? And where does that fit into God's plan? A couple of very quick things. The main thing I want you to understand is that I think the Bible has a very clear picture of us as human beings, which is that we're very bodily creatures. Now, I know that that's kind of, you know that, right? But you're actually part of an intellectual history and where most of you have studied at school and uh, in kind of our universities and whatever, we tend to privilege the mind over all of the other experiences of our life. And Christianly, we tend to have a culture where if you believe something clearly enough or get the truth right enough, all of the other stuff will sort itself out and work itself out. And I want to say to you, I don't think that that's what the Bible says about us. And we actually have to have a much clearer and more complex picture of the way that our bodies and our minds interact with each other. So if you think about us as creatures, what does the Bible say? It says we were made in God's image but we've been made from the dust of the earth and God breathed life into us. So Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish, and etc., etc. We're made in the image of God, but when God created us, he actually, Genesis 2.7, formed us from the dust of the earth. We're of the stuff of this world and God breathed life into our bodies. Now, interestingly, in Genesis 3, when sin comes along, uh, death, the death of our bodies, brings kind of the absence of the experience of our spirit in this world. Genesis 3.19, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. We are very bodily, and our experience of one another is life is attached to the body, and when the body dies, we die. Now, we know that there's a greater future for us, right? But that bodily reality describes the whole way that the scriptures speak about us. Because you think about it, what had to happen in order for you and I to have our sins forgiven and to be saved, God had to become what? God actually had to become a human. God came to earth bodily in order to be able to act on our behalf, to represent us. And actually Jesus came bodily to go through death in order that his body might be raised from the dead, in order that he might be the first fruits and that we might follow and that our bodies might actually be raised and transformed. That is, you're not just a body now, but in God's economy, you will be a body for eternity. Now, what's very interesting about all of those truths is that when the Bible comes to describe you and I as kind of how we think and feel and engage in life in the world, the, the Bible doesn't have these categories that you and I have. You know, there's kind of the spiritual reality and then there's the body bit, which is kind of the icky bit. Or there's the, the mind bit over here and the emotions bit over here and they're not connected to each other. Actually, in the Bible, all of those things are so connected that you can't think without feeling, you can't be human without being bodily, and all the bits relate very tightly with each other. So just to give you some biblical data, if you want to go away and chew, we're at point E. We aren't minds and hearts, but people who think and feel. Notice with me the first four verses there. In all of these verses, your heart is described as thinking. So you know how for us the heart feels and the mind thinks? In the Bible, the heart thinks and it feels. Not only does the heart think and feel, but the mind also thinks and feels. So you see there uh, in Matthew 22, um, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind. Love is actually something that encompasses our thoughts as well as ourselves. But minds become unsettled, Acts 15, 24. And in 2 Corinthians 11, your minds are actually the seat of devotion. If you were to say, 
where does devotion come from? I think we would normally talk about our hearts, but the scriptures talk about our minds and devotion to the Lord. And so 1 Peter 3, 8, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart and a humble mind. All of those things are mashed together in one verse because the, the Bible thinks of you as a person and as a person who does all of your thinking and all of your feeling in a very bodily form. So here is the last piece of data from you. Uh, point F. In the Psalms, when I think the psalmists describe the experience of anxiety and depression that we feel, have you ever noticed how physically they describe that experience? It's not just that I had a terrible emotion or I had a bad thought today, but listen to how the psalmist described their experience. Psalm 61 Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled and my soul also is greatly troubled. What I experience, I experience in my body. Psalm 22, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. My heart is struck down like grass and has withered. I forget to eat my bread because of my loud... Uh, I've just skipped, haven't I, from one to the other. I'm sorry about that. Um, my, my heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shard and my tongue sticks to my jaws. Um, when the Bible speaks to us about the experience of the awfulness of our emotions, it actually speaks very physically about those things because you don't just feel in your head or think in your head or feel in your heart. You actually feel and think and engage with your whole body. And what happens in your body affects your emotions. And what happens in your emotions affects your thinking. And what happens in your thinking affects your body and etc, etc, etc. That is really important when it comes to thinking about anxiety. And I'll show you why in a little picture at the end. But before we get there, there are two other quick things I want to do. The first is to say to you that what the Bible says about the connectedness between our brains and our bodies and our minds and our thoughts and everything else has actually been uh, highlighted in lots of recent neuroscience research. There's all sorts of spaces to uh, explain this, but I'll, can you see the graph that's there on the little chart in front of you that looks something like this? Yep. 10 seconds with the person beside you. What do you think that's a graph of? Come on, 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Have a guess with the person beside you. Um, none of you are going to guess it, by the way, unless you know what this piece of research is. But anyway, that was a great exercise. Hopefully that's helped you to kind of engage just for a moment. This is a graph of your likelihood to receive parole by the time of day at which your parole case is heard. So this guy called Shai Danziger took eight judges in Israel and he looked at 1,100 parole cases over 10 months. And then they did some statistical controlling stuff where, you know, more serious crimes are more likely to get not get parole and stuff like that. So they did a bit of statistical calculations. And then he plotted on a graph when in the day the case was heard and how likely it was that the person was going to get parole. Now, this is, these judges had an average of 22 years of judicial experience, right? These are the most objective, rational kind of... These people have been trained all their lives to be machines of rationality and clear decision-making. This dotted line is morning tea. This dotted line is lunch. If you're at university, pray they mark your exams just after morning tea. <laughs> Isn't it fascinating? When the small child throws the tantrum at the checkout, throws their arms into the air and goes crazy, we all go, they need to eat. The reality is you can be 50 and you can have been trained to be a judge and to be really objective about stuff and how long since you last eat has a massive effect on your ability to make decisions and actually make calls. Isn't that fascinating? You are not a mind 
encased in a body that just happens to be here for the transport and who you really are is your mind, you are a deeply integrated being where your body affects your mind as much as your mind affects your body. And we know it in all sorts of ways. General population, 10% of people suffer from depression. If you have open heart surgery, you're 50% chance from suffering from depression. Why is that? It's because depression is not simply a thing that occurs in your mind. It's because your physiology is actually connected to your experience of depression. What your body is and how it works makes a massive difference and we're all wired differently. So there's this amazing study uh, that a guy has done, a doctor who's looked at special forces training in the US. And they've actually isolated one chemical in your body that he can measure where he can basically work out before you start special forces training whether you're going to make it through or not. Because high levels of that particular chemical uh, actually stop your body from experiencing lots of anxiety. And if you have very low levels of it, it means you'll be hypersensitive and much more reactive to the things that cause people anxiety. Um, we are not brains encased in a body. We are whole people. And therefore, who you are and your upbringing and your environment and the things that are happening to you and your physical health, all of those things affect how anxious you are and when and how you respond and how you engage in the world around about you. Now, I want to show you two fascinating things about that. The first is Christians hundreds of years ago, before they had any of our wondrous modern technology, knew that all of this stuff was true, even though they didn't have the same science or language to describe it. Some of you will know who Spurgeon was. Very famous English preacher from the late 1800s, saw thousands of people converted through his preaching. Uh, and a marvellous man of God who transformed, in many ways, part of his world for the sake of Jesus and his kingdom. Spurgeon actually suffered enormously from anxiety and depression. And he actually preached a number of sermons at different points in his uh, time describing what it was like and inviting other people to respond gently and carefully with people who suffer. So I just want to read you a couple of quotes from some of his sermons. Uh, these, are, uh, these are about 140 years old, these, these talks. This first one is from a sermon that was called The Cause and Cure of a Wounded Spirit. He says, I've heard some say, rather unkindly, Sister so-and-so is so nervous, we can hardly speak in her presence. Yes, but talking like that will not help her. There are many persons who have had this trying kind of nervousness greatly aggravated by the unkindness or thoughtlessness of friends. It is a real disease. It is not imaginary. Imagination, no doubt, contributes to it and increases it, but still there is a reality about it. There are some forms of physical disorder in which a person lying in bed feels great pain though another person, through another person simply walking across the room. Oh, you say, that is more imagination. Well, you might think so if you like, but if you have ever been in that painful condition as I have been many a time, I will guarantee you that you will not talk in that fashion again. I beg you never grieve those upon whom the hand of God is lying in the form of depression of spirit, but be very fond and gentle with them. You need not encourage them in their sadness, but at the same time let there be no roughness in dealing with them. They have many very sore places, and the hand that touches them should be as soft as down. Um, from another sermon called Man Unknown to Man, he says, Especially judge not the sons and daughters of sorrow. Allow no ungenerous suspicions of the afflicted, the poor and the despondent. Do not hastily say they ought to be more brave and exhibit a greater faith. Ask not why they are so nervous and so absurdly fearful. Nay, in this you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. I beseech you, remember that you understand not your fellow man. He's actually saying to some people, you see people who are struggling with this anxiety and depression, and you go, snap out of it. <laughs> Fix yourself up. Get it right. And Spurgeon was pleading with people 150 years ago, Actually, if you haven't experienced it, you don't understand it. 
They need graciousness and they need love and great care. And so I've included this third quote because this is just my favourite and it makes me laugh every time, uh, but it's worth hearing. Spurgeon says, I once knew a minister who had never suffered pain or illness in his life. I was unwell in his house and he most kindly tried to sympathise with me. He did it almost as wonderfully as an elephant picks up a pin. It was a marvel that he could attempt a thing so altogether out of his line. <laughs> now, that's a lovely description of him being aware that the other person was trying really hard, uh, but had basically missed it completely because they had not experienced the discomfort and awfulness of the condition. Now, just to show that this wasn't kind of one moment in history, I bring you forward a little bit to a guy called Martin Lloyd-Jones in the late 1950s. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones was a doctor and a famous preacher. Uh, he was a Welshman uh, and again uh, preached, like saw lots of people converted, was a, a great one of, of the faith. But he wrote a book called Spiritual Depression, which actually was a bestseller uh, at his time. Uh, and in it, he says, what is it that contributes to this kind of condition of anxiety and depression? He doesn't use that language, but that's our words to describe what he was talking about. He says, in my experience, it's four things in this order. Temperament, physical condition, the devil, unbelief. In other words, he says, there are moments when what you believe matters, but he thinks that that's about fourth in line behind just how you're wired and what your experiences of life and whether you've had any illness are and being aware that the devil is at work and actually brings temptation and difficulty and distress for people who are in this place. And again, I want to read to you his words. He says, in other words, as I understand the biblical teaching about this matter, there is nothing which is quite so important as that we should without delay and as quickly as possible get to know ourselves. For the fact of the matter is that though we are all Christians together, we are all different and the problems and the difficulties, the perplexities and the trials that we are likely to meet are in large measure determined by the difference of temperament and of type. We are all in the same fight, of course, as we share the same common salvation and have the same common central need, but the manifestations of the trouble vary from case to case and from person to person. There is nothing more futile when dealing with this condition than to act on the assumption that all Christians are identical in every respect. They are not, and they are not even meant to be. And so he says, does someone hold the view that as long as you are a Christian, it does not matter what the condition of your body is? Well, you will soon be disillusioned if you believe that. Now, what both of those guys are saying is actually what we've seen in the science and we've seen that the Bible describes, you are a human person. And every one of you inhabits a body that's very different from the person beside you. And for some of us, that body, by God's grace and kindness, doesn't get affected much by stresses and strains. And um, I actually give thanks to God for my brothers and sisters who are like that because they often provide stability and continuity and people like that have been really precious to me in my life. Uh, but I know that God has made each one of us differently. And for some of us, he's wired our bodies in ways that when we experience the mess of the world, um, it's a very deep physical experience that affects our brains and our emotions in ways that we are not in control of. Okay? The other thing that I want to point out before I finish this first bit, in the New Testament, the word anxious is incredibly positive as well as incredibly negative. Now, you all know the verses, right? Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything. Uh, and Jesus says, Matthew 6, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. In all of the rest of these passages, the bold underlined word is exactly the same word as that word in the original. But our Bibles translate it with a different word. So in Philippians 2, when Paul says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely anxious for your welfare. Timothy is actually commended because he's anxious about how the Philippians are doing. So being anxious is not just a sin and it's not just a wrong thing, but sometimes the Bible actually says being anxious is exactly the right thing for people who live in this world. Or 1 Corinthians 12, 
I love this. God has so composed the body of Christ, all the members who are in the body, giving greater honour to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same anxiety for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together. God has made us not to be impassive, non-anxious, never experiencing anything feelings. That's not who we are. He's actually made us as people who have these systems in our body that sometimes are really healthy and helpful and useful in the world. And so in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul doesn't say, you shouldn't be anxious, be not anxious. He says, be anxious about the things of the Lord, but not about the things of this world. He says, it's not that anxiety is a problem, but pray that God would help you direct your anxieties in the right direction. Pray that he will slowly over time help you to be more anxious about the things that concern Jesus and his kingdom and what it means to live with Christ as Lord, rather than the other things which cause us anxiety. So, we're deeply embodied. Anxiety is not just a sin, it's not automatically wrong, it's a thing that God has made and is part of us. And we live in this fallen world. I have one picture to draw and then we're going to have a 30 seconds stand and stretch your legs break before I do some practical stuff. Here's you and here's the world in which you live and here's your thoughts and emotions. All right? If you think about this world and you think about how the Bible talks about the world, which of these things is affected by sin? All of it. The whole jolly lot is affected by sin. But actually, it's not all except, uh, affected in the same way. And what Jesus has done on the cross won't fix it all in the same way or in the same time frame. So Genesis tells us that the creation kind of is scarred. So God affects, you know, you will eat by the, by the sweat of your brow and thorns and thistles will come up. And Romans 8 speaks about the creation groaning in a state of decay as it longs for the future. So the created world has been affected by the fall and is messy. And when is that going to get fixed up? Well, the Bible is very clear that the created world is going to finally be restored when Jesus comes back at the end. For all of your life and my life, the world's going to involve things that bite you and hurt you and maim you and illnesses and earthquakes and famines and plagues and COVIDs and other things like that. We live in a fallen world that's going to continue to be fallen. Now you as a person, you are actually part of that fallen world and you inhabit a body that's part of that fallen world. So your physiology and the way that your body works and all that kind of stuff, it's not perfect. You don't yet inhabit a body that's fit for eternity. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15 says that when Jesus comes back, you're going to inherit a body that's been transformed so that it's ready to live in eternity. And can I tell you, I long for that day, for to have a body that was unaffected by sin and by the craziness of my mind that was and by the mess of my anxiety when I experience it, what a privilege that Jesus will one day come back and I will have a body that won't feel all of that stuff. That is awesome. But in the here and now, I don't see Jesus anywhere telling me he's going to sort my body out so that it's ready for eternity now. I'm going to continue to dwell in a body that's waiting for Jesus to come back and take it to heaven. So I expect that it's going to be messy. And actually, I know it's going to be messy because as you get older, your body falls apart and you can do less and less things. In the midst of all of this, God saves us. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we come to faith in him, he grants us life and the hope of the future. And he sets his spirit on us and grants us a new heart. And he calls on us to live differently, to start thinking differently, to start feeling differently and engaging differently in the world. And he tells us that by his grace, he will help us to work on this as we walk through this broken world. All of it is going to finally be restored when Jesus comes back at the very end. 
But that means that my experience of life in this body, I actually expect to be a broken, difficult and uncomfortable experience. Where actually what I'm called to have is not a happy life or a pain-free life or a totally comfortable life, but a life where I learn to grow more and more dependent on my Heavenly Father and to persevere in love and grace and good works with my neighbour as I seek to keep trying to live out what Christ has won for me on the cross as I wait for him to return. And I think the Bible's picture of that is that it's messy. And I have good days and I have bad days and I sin again and I need forgiveness and I have difficulty and all of that kind of stuff happens, right? Now, that has really significant implications. Your body is part of the fallen world. It acts on creation. Creation acts on it. Your thoughts and feelings are not independent of your body, but are tied to your body, and your body affects it, and your thinking and feeling affects your body. What that means is that as we wrestle with anxiety, it's going to be a really complex mixture of what's happening in our environment, what's happening physiologically in terms of the chemicals and the bits and pieces that were around inside me, and the way that I think and feel about things. And for every Christian that I know who has actually come to terms with wrestling through this, it's not so much that you get completely cured, although some people have the blessing of having a short period and they go on to have another plate, but it's more that you learn to live with it. But you learn to live with it in a way that you understand more deeply God's presence and power in your life, and you learn to live with it in a way that you understand that you are still waiting for heaven and you keep praying for that and you long for it. And you learn to live with it in a way that actually perseverance is part in itself of the way that God grows you. And as he does that, he actually equips you to love and serve other people who are going through the same thing. I want to get practical in a moment, but you need to stretch your legs. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to stand up, turn around and sit down. All right, um, I know that, that wasn't very long, but hopefully that was just kind of a bit of a moment to kind of shake things out and just have a short break. We are going to have a slightly longer break in a minute. Um, I'm going to whip through this next bit a bit faster because I want us to get to questions because I think that that would be really helpful. Um, what this next bit is, is then these are some of my reflections over time about how to think and engage as a Christian in life of this idea that I may just have to learn to live with and live beside and love people who are struggling with anxiety. There are lots more things that you could say. These are some things that I think are kind of concrete outworkings that are really important and helpful. If you hear nothing else tonight, the one thing that I want you to hear is that if you know Jesus, you stand in a place of absolute grace in relationship with your heavenly Father. And I want to say the Bible, I think, gives weight to that by using this picture of adoption as God's children as one of the key images to describe the Christian life. 1 John 3, 1, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. And I want you to think about being children and being adopted for a minute because children, I don't know if you've noticed this, don't pop out of families and come back into families and then do naughty things and pop out of the family and then come back into the family again. Children stay in the family even when they stuff things up. I have been through teenagehood and I have now raised three young adult children who have all been through teenagehood. And uh, I say this with their permission, um, all of them did some stupid things as teenagers. Um, varying levels of stupid, and I'm not going to share with you how stupid, um, but there were moments of extreme tension and disappointment and anger and all sorts of things that were very difficult for them to live with and for us to live with and all that kind of stuff. Never once in all of that time, even when they had done things that they were really ashamed of and that we felt really disappointed about, did they ever leave our family? There was not even a hint of a moment 
when it was like they're outside now and they have to come back. When God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, sets his spirit on you and adopts you into his family as his children, you are not on probation. You're not kind of on L plates and if you stuff up and get three demerit points, you'll lose your license and you have to come back and apply again. Actually, when God makes you his in Christ, you sit as one of his children through every moment of your life. When you get it right and when you get it wrong, God is still your father. And when things go wrong and you make mistakes, God is more willing to hear you come and say sorry and ask forgiveness than you are to go and ask for it. And what that means is that if you struggle with anxiety and that you're worried that your anxiety is a sin, can I please tell you that is not God's perspective. The Bible tells people not to fear over a hundred times. None of those hundred are rousing on people. Actually, every time that God or an angel or someone comes along and says, fear not, it's an act of kindness and gentleness to remind you that this might seem scary, but you don't need to be afraid because God is with you in some way, shape or form. When the anxiety is really bad, you will feel like God is a million miles away. I just want you to know at that point, your feelings don't represent reality. When Jesus went to the cross and gave himself to wash you clean of every sin and to set you in new relationship with your heavenly father, he actually made you a child. And that's where you stand in relationship with God. So know that when it's crazy and mad and you can't stop your brain, um, for me, it's 4 a.m. when I've had the same thought 4,000 times and I can't work out what to do next. And I find something to distract myself for 30 seconds and then I find I've been thinking that thought another 4,000 times. God's with me and he loves me. And even when I can't sort my brain out to think properly about him or his gospel, he's still there. That's the nature of grace and it's the nature of the gospel. And brothers and sisters, can I encourage you please just to preach that to each other and to remind each other and to encourage each other that even in our fallenness and madness and brokenness, God is our Father. Second thing I want to say then is that if you think of yourself as someone who's struggling with anxiety, and I've, this language I've gained from a group called the CCEF in the US, you do so as a sufferer and as a sinner. So anxious people are sinners. Just want to be honest about that. Uh, I'm a sinner. Whitney's a sinner. Beck's a sinner. They'll be okay with me saying that. I'm pretty sure if you're not, come and talk to me afterwards. <laughs> anxious people do sin. And so there are moments in our life when we need to engage with that and repent and say sorry and ask for forgiveness and do all of those things. But I think the primary experience of anxious people is not as sinners biblically, but it's as sufferers who are living as part of this fallen creation in bodies that are messy and waiting their restoration in the new heavens and the new earth. If you perceive your anxiety primarily through the lens of sin, I want to encourage you to replace that lens with the lens of suffering along with the Lord Jesus as God shapes you and prepares you for heaven. You do that as a sinner who will get some stuff wrong and you'll need to engage with that and fix it. But actually you stand as a sufferer and a, and a sinner and you do as a child of God. So the third thing I want to say is, and this is where this gets a bit messy and tricky, Everyone that I know who's wrestled with this stuff and gotten a bit better, you have to learn to be responsible for something you're not in control of. I'm going to say that again. You have to learn how to be responsible for something that you're not in control of. 
What do I mean by that? Well, remember all this stuff that Beck showed us about physiology? When that kind of sympathetic bit of you goes off, it goes off and it's automatic and your body responds to the trigger and it goes crazy. And if in that moment you go, I should be responsible for this and I should be in control of this, that's not what's happening. You're living in a fallen body and it's gone off. But over time, you have to work out that as much as that happens to me, there are some things that I can do that are about me trying to take healthy responsibility for myself, even if it doesn't fix the problem or manage it completely in every circumstance. And it's really, it's basic stuff, right? It's stuff like what you eat. Like I know for me, eating less sugar is actually really significant. Um, I exercise five or six mornings a week because I know that exercise has a really significant impact in moderating my anxiety. And when I stop doing it, I start to feel more anxious. So there, now, those things aren't absolute solutions and they don't mean that I never feel anxious. But each of those things contributes in some way over time to being in a space where I'm a bit healthier and a bit more able to manage myself. Uh, there are other disciplines that are important. The discipline of just continually going, you know, working away at reading the scriptures and knowing that your Lord loves you and being reminded of the gospel. And when it's really bad, it's hard to do that by yourself. But those Disciplines, if I can use that language, which I know is slightly dirty language in our world because discipline's not a lovely thing, um, but actually being disciplined and finding habits in your life that help you to manage it a bit is part of taking responsibility for something that you're not in control of. Does that make sense? Um, you'll see there's a couple of quotes down there. There's a book from the Black Dog Institute, uh, which are stories of people's uh, uh, experience of anxiety and depression. The editors at the beginning say one of the big things for every person in this book is that each of them will tell you there was a point in their experience where they worked out, they had to work out how to take some responsibility for this thing. It didn't mean taking blame for it or saying I'm deeply responsible for this thing that's happened to me, but they had to take some responsibility for going and seeing the doctor and taking medication or doing their exercise or doing the, the habits that help you to manage. Does that make sense? So working out, how do you talk about taking responsibility when you're not in control? It's not about blame, but you can take responsibility. So my D there, please seek medical help. Um, there are some parts of the world where people will tell you, if you have enough faith, you'll solve it. Um, I just think that that's utterly stupid and not biblical in any way, shape or form. Doctors will not solve and fix everything. You'll have to go away and do stuff and know how you think and learn how to think in new patterns and challenge your thoughts and do a lot of other stuff. There's lots of hard work that you will do. But professionals in this space can do lots of things that can be helpful. Um, and particularly, if your anxiety is deeply biologically controlled, medication can have a massive impact for some people in ways that gets your mind clear enough that you can start thinking again rather than just being confused and out of your mind. Don't be afraid of the medical world, but understand that they're human and it's slow and it's messy. <laughs> okay? Uh, and that means um, two things. I'm going to swap E and F just at this moment because this feels better to me while I'm saying it, so live with it. Perseverance is I think one of the keys to working out how to manage it. And I just want to tell you one little story here. In 2008, uh, I was in a point of, I was experiencing severe burnout uh, and I was exhausted. And I went to a conf Christian conference uh, and the guy who was speaking at that conference, which was from another part of Australia, and most of you won't know him, uh, was a guy that I'd known a bit and we caught each other in the foyer for about 20 minutes before a night session. And he chatted to me and he said, how are you going? And I kind of indicated that I struggle, was struggling a bit and he kind of indicated he was struggling a bit. And I said to him, we'll call him Bill for the moment, that's not his real name. I said, Bill, how do you keep going? He was in ministry, he'd been in ministry for a long time. He was probably in his late 60s at this point in time. And I'll never forget what he said to me. 
not what I was expecting at all. He said, sheer bloody mindedness. <laughs> and at the time, I was slightly affronted by that and slightly taken back. Uh, but actually, as I've gone on in my life, I understand more and more what he meant by that. What he meant was, even in spite of the fact that he experiences long periods of depression and anxiety when he finds it really hard to get out of bed in the morning, he's, by the grace of God, going to keep putting one foot in front of the other and holding on to the promises that he knows and persevering in knowing that God loves him and trying to serve other people, even though some days the very best he can do is maybe get out of bed, have a cup of tea, and sit in the sunshine rather than lying in bed. And so I go back to point E. Learn to give yourself a good talking to. Martin Lloyd-Jones talks about a lot in his book, Spiritual Depression, and what he means by that is, preach the gospel to yourself. <laughs> Just stop and remind yourself, talk to yourself, you know, if you struggle with anxiety, you have a lot of self-talk that goes on, right? <laughs> Practice changing that self-talk to be the kind of self-talk that grows out of your biblical worldview and out of the truths that you know in the gospel and tell yourself to keep going. And it happens at different levels. So John Chapman, does anyone know who John Chapman is in the room? There's a few people. Chapo was a great, a wonderful evangelist who worked in the Armidale Diocese in Sydney for many, many years. Um, Chapo was a single man all of his life and he said in ministry he often felt really depressed after he got home from giving a talk and he would get home feeling really depressed and he'd catch himself getting really depressed and he said I would give myself a good talking to I would say to myself Chapo did you preach the gospel tonight and his answer was yes Chapo <laughs> did you invite people to become Christians tonight yes <laughs> Chapo is God still in charge of the world yes then Chapo, go to bed and stop whinging. <laughs> um, what it was, was habits and patterns of trying to work out how to talk to himself out of his Christian worldview in ways that just helped him to engage a little better with stuff when he was having a hard day. So let me draw my last little picture and then I think we're going to finish and head for questions. Um, the perseverance thing in my experience, is particularly important because of the little... No, oh, that's disappointing. Um, <laughs> if you imagine that this person here has flippers, right? And they're swimming towards the surface. Yep. Okay. If they're here and they open their mouth to breathe, what does it feel like? Give me some words that describe that feeling. Unsafe. Thank you very much. Um, it feels like you're going to die, right? If you open your mouth and try to breathe there, do you realize it feels exactly the same? Exactly the same. And one of the things that is a real struggle for people in this space is... You can go and visit your doctor and start to take the medication and try to do the discipline stuff and do your exercise and whatever and you can swim and swim and swim and swim and you still open your mouth and feel like I'm underwater. You can have done all of this work and effort but it will sometimes still feel the same way. And I want to say to you, if you just keep swimming most people will at least get times in their life when they start to breathe again. But because we're used to a very fast response world, I do the right thing and then it fixes the problem, often people go to a doctor and they get some advice and they try to do it for a couple of weeks and they go, well, that didn't work, so I'm just going to throw it away. And what I want to say to you is perseverance is absolutely crucial for most of the stuff that's going to make a difference for you long term in terms of engaging with your anxiety. So my final... I've got lots of final things, don't I? But anyway, <laughs> what I do want to say is that fellowship and friendship is so very important and precious in this space. And I want to say to you, if you are struggling in some way, shape or form, it will terrify you to tell other people, and probably particularly to tell other people at church, 
But if you can find some people that you trust that you can talk about this with, their friendship and encouragement will be absolutely vital for you in terms of your growth and perseverance. If your friend comes and shares with you, can I just say a few things to you? You don't have to fix their problem. It's not your job to fix them. It's not your job to talk about it with them every time you see them. In fact, that will be detrimental. It is your job just to be human and a friend and a brother or sister in Christ. And what that means is some days you ask them how they're going and you mourn with them and you pray with them and you grieve. And other days you say, let's go to the movies and watch something stupid because I need a brain break. It's actually about having long-term, safe, committed friendship where people can talk about stuff when they need to, but where they learn and you keep helping people remember life is not just about this anxiety thing that I have. Life is about life and I need to learn how to engage with that. And it's actually for me, um, my dear wife and certain precious friends have been very important in that space for me in terms of just persevering and being reminded of the truth. And so here is the great promise of the Bible. Do you know that your anxiety in the grace of God will be part of what forms you in the likeness of Christ? There's this book called My Age of Anxiety. It's actually a secular book where this guy tells his story about his own wrestle with anxiety. And my favorite point in the book is when he says to his wife, I so desperately wish that I didn't have this thing. And she goes, yeah, but if you didn't, you'd probably be a real jerk. <laughs> and, and he said, at the time, that was quite offensive and I didn't kind of know what to do with it. But he said, as I've thought about it, I've realized actually she's right. Part of who I am and who I have become is because I've wrestled with this thing and it's made me sensitive and aware and more thoughtful and a bunch of other things. That's a man who does not know God and doesn't know the gospel. What does the God of the Bible say to his sons and daughters? He says that every single thing that comes into your life, by my grace and the work of my spirit and the word of God, I will use to shape and transform you in dependence and in the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you suffer and I know that this is really hard to cling on to, I just want you to know it is actually God's gift. That's outrageous language, isn't it? And when you're in a really bad space, it will be really hard to know that. But the Lord God will hold you in the space of your wrestle with anxiety and he will use it to slowly form and shape you in the likeness of Jesus. It'll be messy It'll be two steps forward and one step backwards. And sometimes it'll be three steps backwards and half a step forward. But that's okay because God's with you and he loves you and he knows you. And he will keep using it to shape you as a servant of Jesus. And there is a day when it will go away. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. Amen. I'm going to pray briefly, and then we're going to have a short break and some questions. Um, Father in heaven, your word has so much to say to us, but we pray particularly tonight that you would remind us of the incredibly precious promise that through Jesus and by your spirit we are your children. And Father, thank you that as we experience life in all of its mess, we never step outside of being your children. And so, Father, I pray particularly for brothers and sisters who are struggling, 
that you might help them to remember and to know, particularly when it's bad, that you are with them and that you care for them and that you are going to hold them even through this. And we pray, Father, that you might provide the help and assistance that's required, that people might find ways of persevering and coping with this thing that feels so awful. Father, especially in all of it, help us to remember our Lord Jesus, who suffered and gave himself up for us, who knows exactly what it is like, and who is our faithful and precious High Priest. Father, please carry us in him and bring us home in him, we pray. Amen. Well, what a helpful talk from Paul. I particularly love the way he pointed out from the Bible the connectedness of our mind and body and thinking and emotions. Now, these are much more enmeshed than we think. And what a great testimony to the goodness and kindness of God, even in our sufferings. Well, if you'd like to learn more about anxiety, I highly recommend Paul's book, When the Noise Won't Stop, A Christian Guide to Dealing with Anxiety. And that's available from Matthias Media. And we've got lots of other videos on our YouTube channel about the Bible and different topics, including Big Ideas videos like this one. So check it out and consider subscribing. And if you would like to connect with us here at Hunter Bible Church, come and visit our website using the link in the show notes. We would love to meet you.